Good morning, church. You guys turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand. Somebody will grab you one, get it to you. We've been going through this passage, chapter 5, starting at verse 17. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. We're going to look at verse 21 this morning. Submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of the Lord. It isn't a matter of, you know, well... We just dive into it. You know, Paul's told us, don't be drunk with wine. Don't get in that excess of just life here on planet Earth. But now get filled with the Holy Spirit. And what he means is fill yourself. Fill yourself. Keep your mind busy on the things of the Lord. Keep after the things of the Lord. And then he adds this, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. He puts it in this order because it's impossible to submit to one another the way he's going to describe it unless you are being filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, the lost, the world out there, the unbelievers, they don't do this. They won't do this and they can't do this. This is a meaningless exhortation to the world. It's only meant for us. You know, the drunk, he would never submit himself to each other. You know, they're, they're rabble-rousers. They're, they're a little aggressive when they're under the intoxication of the, the drink. He's totally lacking in this self-control. But God has given this ability of control to his people. And, uh, you know, again, showing us that we must be different than what we used to be. You know, one way we are different is in verse 19 and 20 it says speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody how's it going in your heart to the lord isn't that what we just did seems like that was what we were just doing you know giving thanks always for all things to god the father in the name of the lord jesus christ you know you're a believer now You come to church, we gather together, we worship, we praise the Lord. We do that with joy and with service, and then there's opportunity to bless one another as we're here. And Paul will show us that this submission is going to run through your whole life. He's going to talk about husbands and wives, and oh, next week, we're going to get into marriage counseling. I know you're all going to want to be here, right? I'm not even married yet. Yeah, but you're probably going to be one of these days, you know. And if you are, you probably need a refresher course, right? Then he's going to talk about children obey parents. None of you guys are kids, so you don't have to worry about that. And then masters and servants. He's going to bring up this principle of submission because it runs clear through your life. We Christians were to praise and worship together and then we're to submit to one another and behave as outlined in these relationships that he's going to talk about. So what does that submission look like? And we're going to be talking about this for months. But... Being subject to one another, being submissive to one another is like the picture of a soldier just enlisted in the army. You're under an officer. In a sense, you're no longer an individual, right? The first thing they drum out of you at boot camp is you. (laughs) You know that, right? You're in this team. You belong to me now. You're going to do what I say. So you don't get up when you want to. You don't eat when you want to. You don't rest when you want to. Oh, suddenly, I'm accountable, and I'm to be this kind of person in that situation, and this is my team, this is my unit, and I'm supposed to fight and work 
as a team, work as one. When we became Christians, we signed away our rights to determine what we do with our life. <clears throat> That's tough for an American. Isn't that, isn't that getting in your face, just saying that? Well, I didn't sign away my rights. You're not to live as you would live. You're to live as Christ wants you to live. And we're supposed to be good soldiers. <laughs> do what you're told. Nobody tells me what to do. I can just feel it, can't you? I feel that inside of me. The, the little bristly hairs stand up. I can no longer go on holiday when I decide to. I must ask. I can't just wake up when I want to. Oh no, Reveille's at a certain time. We have become men and women under authority. Under authority. It's interesting, you know, Jesus was a man under authority. When we're filled with the Spirit, we voluntarily act in this way with respect towards one another. We're members of the same unit, of the same regiment, you know, of the same great army. Jesus says in John 13, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Oh. You know, if you want to look at this negatively, what it, what it looks like negatively is we must stop being thoughtless. Most of the clashes and problems you're going to run into in your life because you speak before you think. You do before you reason. You know? <laughs> oh, we leap before we look. Ready, fire, aim. That's the way we go through life. And the Christian is one who is supposed to be governed by truth. Governed by reason. Governed by understanding and thinking. And we're supposed to look before we leap. We're supposed to think before we speak. We don't just trust instinct. And as Christians, we can't be selfish or self-centered. Because that's only thinking about you. And we're supposed to be submissive to everyone around us right here in this group. So the Christian, while he is an individual, cannot be individualistic. I hope you understand the difference between that. You're an individual. We all are individuals. But you've got to get rid of that me mentality. I have rights and I have this and I have that. In the army, you must submit to one another, to your leader, you know. So the Christian also must never be opinionated. Now get this, we must have opinions. We must have strong opinions. But the man who is opinionated is self-centered. He's proud of his opinions. He's proud. You ever met this Christian? Man, oh, all those losers out there, I was smart enough to come to Jesus. I was, at least I chose him, you know. And, and it always cracks me up. It's like, you think that's what it was, huh? He's this self-made man. I've never met one of those. You? He parades around in his beliefs. Oh, if you guys just knew what I knew. If you guys had just attained to the level I have attained to. And that guy... I don't know if you've noticed, but that person that does that, there are clashes and train wrecks all around that guy's life. 
that is not being submissive to one another <laughs> they have a bad habit of trying to lord it over people you know Peter 5 1 says the elders who are among you I exhort who am a fellow elder elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed shepherd the flock of God which is among you serving as overseers not by compulsion but willingly not for dishonest gain but eagerly nor as being lords over those entrusted you but being examples to the flock if you have any part of this idea of lording over people ruling over them You must get rid of that idea. We are all a team. We are all equal here. Sure, I've got a position. I've been called to teach. Whoopee, you know? You've probably got a more important position. You've been called to pray. You've been called to serve. You've been called to do all kinds of things. If any of this self seeking tendency is in you squish it squash it put it away from you so as we look at this picture the negative picture of what it means not to submit or or to submit is someone who is selfish self-centered opinionated uh, wants to be dictatorial, you know, wants to dominate you, and then they're hypersensitive about themselves. Do you hear what he said? He has no right to say that about me. But now we need to look at the positive side. The first thing that being spirit-filled does to you is it opens your eyes to who you are. <laughs> to what you are. I, I love that. It opens the eyes of your understanding and suddenly you see the truth about self. I'm a jerk. <laughs> I, I am a sinner. I am hopeless. I am lost. I am damned. I am, I am in trouble. Because we're all sinners. There's none righteous. No, not one. And immediately when you come to that realization, you stop trusting you. You stop trusting self. Self starts to show up and you're going, no, no, you're an idiot. Get away from me. I need, I need to seek some real help out here somewhere. Our morality, our goodness, our wisdom and knowledge and understanding, my great education, all falls to the ground right there. It's all just nothing. And that's the gospel and that's the Holy Spirit that does that in a person. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 For who makes you different from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as though you had not received it? What is it that makes us different from one another? Only what God brings not what you bring. Everything you have has been a gift of God. Comes down from the Father of Lights, right? We are what we are right now by the grace of God. And in that mindset, what just happened to pride? Can't be there. What just happened to boasting? arrogance what happened to self oh the foolishness that we have become in this world and yet even as Christians we're still very ignorant we're still very fallible very prone to error and to sin and to wrong this truth about ourselves is very, very valuable. Because it's there you find out that you're just a babe in Christ. 
You're just learning to walk. You're just learning to grow. And it's there we realize that we are truly under someone else's leadership, under someone else's control. You know, I remember walking this life and looking down at certain people. Oh, that idiot. Oh, that jerk. Oh, that guy, you know. Poor bugger, you know. But now I see the truth. That whole time, my Lord was looking down at me, going, oh, that bugger. Oh, that poor, that jerk, you know. I am simply a clump of dust that God has breathed upon and everything I have belongs to him and is because of him. <sighs> Doesn't that help you to see we're all in this together? We're all just equals. We're all just members of the same unit. Oh, we're all different members. But there's only one body. And it doesn't matter what member of the body you are. It's that you are a member of that body. Could care less what member I am. I just want to be a member in the body of Christ. And what matters most is not the parts, but the whole. That's what matters most. Half of the church's problem is the problem of America in the 21st century and we have become all about self, all about us. Well, good thing, you know, Jesus came and saved me. Yeah, it is a great thing he came to save you. But look at everybody else he saved. And look, what, look at who he needs to save. You know, but it becomes all about my comfort, all about my joy. All about my peace and my pleasure. Instead of realizing, no, 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 my focus should be on the church. My focus should be, is everybody experiencing the same blessing? Is everybody healthy? Is everybody enjoying what I enjoy? It's not my, ro my, my rights. It's not my glory. It's not my comfort. It's the unit. It's the unit's comfort and joy and glory. It's the advancement of the whole unit, the whole team. It's the advancement of the church that should be my priority. So the spirit-filled one is the, is the Christian who's listening. They're ready to learn and grow. Have you noticed you don't have a monopoly on truth? Have you noticed that? You know, I'm pretty sure I don't have it. But some other people do. Well, not a monopoly on it, but they have truth also, right? So you become patient you listen, you ask questions, you seek, you knock. And you also become willing to suffer. We don't like that idea. You become willing to suffer, even suffer injustice for the sake of the body. Think about what 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says. Love suffers long and is kind. That's love. Love suffers long and is kind. It does not envy, does not parade itself, it's not puffed up, it does not behave rudely, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked, it thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. And the only ones who can do that with joy are the spirit-filled ones who are submitting to one another. And when you do that, you display the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, is love. Now the fruit of the Spirit is one. It's love. 
but it shows up in all these very various characteristics joy peace long-suffering kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control and I don't know where you are in that list but do you realize that list is not for you it's not individual that list is for everybody else you ever get around they need love they need joy they need peace they need long suffering they need patience you know they need goodness and gentleness and self control all of those fruits are so you and I can get along together so we can submit to one another you know there's an illustration of this it's a weird illustration but there's an illustration of this in 1 Corinthians 14 29 it says let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge but if anything is revealed to another who sits by let the first keep silent for you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged and the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets so one man gets up and he says I got a little something from the Lord for you and he begins to speak and another guy goes hey that reminds me I think I also have something and the guy says no 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 you can't speak because the Lord is speaking through me no 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 the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet so sit down and shut up for a minute and let this other guy speak that's submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord but there's a very important point here we submit to people like us who have believed the basics of Christianity, right? The fundamental doctrines of Christianity, we do not submit necessarily to untruth. Remember Paul taught us for three chapters, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 of the doctrines of God before he got to this passage. And those doctrines are preeminent. And if someone comes and has different doctrine, different understanding, different ways, we don't necessarily submit to that. We correct that. The New Testament and its doctrines come before everything else. And all our opinions must be put aside. <laughs> and we're going to conform to that standard. So the truth that we're studying, again, is only to those who have agreed to the New Testament standard. The incarnation, the cross, you know, the basics, the truths. Because we, as it says in Ephesians 2.20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone that is our standard it is there that we endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace remember Galatians chapter 2 Paul's writing and he says you know Peter came to this festival one day and he ate for a couple of three days with the Gentiles and then then some Jews some really important Jews came from Jerusalem and he stopped eating with the Gentiles and he kind of separated himself and Paul says I had to get into his face publicly I had to stand before him and say you are wrong in what you are doing now here is Peter who's Paul think he is Peter is one of the top three. You know, he was with Jesus everywhere he went. And here's this latecomer, Paul, stepping in and saying, no, 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 you were wrong there. You, you remember reading what Peter's opinion of Paul was? Peter calls him our beloved brother Paul that is submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. <laughs> 
So this submitting has nothing to do with wrong doctrine or wrong teaching or false prophets. It's none of that stuff. But it's for those who agree in the fundamentals. We all know that there are issues, biblical issues, that we don't all agree on. Yeah, okay, cool. Then submit to one another in those things. Be kind. Be gentle. Love those people. Maybe they just don't know any better, and maybe they've studied and more, know more than you do. You, you don't know. Let the others have their say, listen, and have self-control, right? Is it a big deal? No, it's not a big deal today. Off it goes. If you have no opinions, you're not a Christian. But if you're opinionated, you're a very poor Christian. God grant us the ability to know that difference. So be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. Be submissive to others. Hold and teach the truth in love. And then your personal relationships will be sweet. be sweet no no issues no big problems and when you do that the God of glory will be glorified in you and in this place and the world will see that and we're to do this notice those words we're to do this in the fear of Christ <laughs> that must be our motive and it's an essential part of this teaching um, because this is the general principle that's going to overflow the rest of this book. I mean, you think about it. We, we get into 522 and it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Oh, where'd that come from? Oh, it's the same teaching. He's saying everything is overshadowed by as to the Lord. Ephesians 6.1 Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Notice he's always adding this in. In the Lord. Ephesians 6.5 Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. This is the principle of life. This whole passage is full of this principle. And it is useless to consider doing any of these things he's about to tell us to do without being filled with the Spirit and without doing it in the fear of the Lord. So what does the fear of the Lord mean? Oh, we're supposed to tremble and be scared and he might send us to hell. No, that isn't the fear of the Lord. Everything the Christian does is supposed to be done in the fear of the Lord. And we ignore that command at our own peril. So we don't just do it because it's good and right of itself. The world tries to do that. Oh, why don't we all just hold hands and get along and then there'd be no more war and everything would be peaceful and, you know, if there were no borders and no countries and no, you know, none of this stuff, then everything would be great. You're idiots. Because you're all sinners. And that will never work. It'll all blow up in your face. You know, I'm watching this stupid special on the Eagles. I really liked the Eagles back in the day, you know, the, the band. And then they, they, they kind of broke up and then they got back together. And then they, the first, one of the first songs they wrote was, Why Can't We All Just Get Along, you know? And, and it made me so laugh. Because here's five guys in the band and you can't get along for 20 minutes. And you're trying to tell the world, Why don't we all just get along? You know what hypocrite means, right? We're to do... We're to do this because we are not our own. We've been bought at a price. 
We are bond slaves of Christ. Bond servants is fine, but it really means bond slaves. And I know America hates that term. You volunteered to be a slave. Bond slave. Bond means volunteer. Slave means slave. You've signed up. You've enlisted in God's army. <laughs> that was a dumb thing, right? Now I got to get up at you know, and, and man, here comes all of these things. The differentiating mark of the Christian is that we do everything as unto the Lord in the fear of Christ, because Christ is Lord. And I don't think Americans really understand what Lord means. I think we have all these quaint ideas. You know, I think in England they have a better understanding of what Lord means. Because if someone was, a, was your Lord, they owned your house, they owned your kids, they owned your wife, and they owned you. They owned you. And you're like, well, that's uncomfortable. Until you figure out it's Jesus that owns you. We need to understand this because our world is telling us, you know, oh, if you just submit. No, 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 that isn't it. No more class, no more colors, no more races, no more borders, no more nationalities. We just get along. Everything would be equal and everything would be peaceful. That is not what Paul is telling us to do. Paul is not interested in political or social reasons or reform. There's one reason. Because Christ is Lord. There's one reason. The Christian is moved by a deep and profound motive of fear of the Lord. And that will govern and rule him. I am not concerned with keeping the law. I am concerned with breaking my Lord's heart. I am concerned with disappointing him. That is my concern. That is my fear. <laughs> my fear is I'm going to hurt him. My fear is I'm going to break his heart. My fear is I'm a disappointment to him. That's my fear. Here's what Christ has done. You know, he's bought us with his blood. He's taken us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. I've been adopted into the family. I'm now in a relationship with the Father and with His only Son. And a man who is filled with the Spirit, that Spirit is constantly reminding him of who the Father is and who Christ is, of what they've done for us. It's constantly revealing Christ. It's constantly reminding us and leading us to Christ. It's constantly glorifying Christ in us. So the spirit filled Christian is a Christian who knows what he is doing and why he is doing it. I don't just have a set of rules. I have a love relationship and I do not want to break that relationship. I do not want to harm that relationship. So we submit to one another. <laughs> It's the plain and clear teaching of the whole of the New Testament. You think about what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 20. It's kind of long and I'm going to have to read it, so just bear with me. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John, right? Came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and one on your left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink that a cup that I am 
going to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am to be baptized with. And they said to him, we are able. Boy, what, what interesting kids they were, right? So he says to them, oh, you will indeed drink that cup. And you will be baptized with this baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. I thought you were Lord of all. I am, but I'm a man under authority, right? There's still one over, over him. But as for those who, whom it is prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard about it, you know the other ten disciples, you, you remember them, right? They see Peter and John, they see James and John over there with mom, and mom's kneeling down. Oh, that you might do this for my boys. Can you imagine the little uh, stuff that's, what, what's going on over there? Oh, they want to be special. They want to lord it over us. Oh, they want to be the leaders. I'm sure that went over really good, right? They were greatly displeased with these two brothers. Hmm, can't imagine. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and all those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Did you catch that? This is what it looks like to submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. You want to be somebody? Show up early and shovel the walks. Come in here and vacuum the chairs. Come in here and help. You, you want to be great? Then find something needs done and do it. And do it with no hoopla. Do it just showing up and doing it because it needs it done. Or you might look at John 13, 12. Jesus at the Last Supper. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. Did you catch that? And you say, Well, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Oh, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than him who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. There is no doubt or controversy. This is why we submit to one another, and it is clear through the New Testament. Man, if it was good enough for Jesus, it must be good enough for me to do. And another reason we do it is because this is how we show gratitude to him. All that he has done, the incarnation, his perfect obedience to the Father, his substitutionary death on that cross for us, his death, his burial, his resurrection. How do I say thank you? Submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. And this obedience, It's very interesting because it says in his high priestly prayer in John 17, he says, I have glorified you on earth, Father. I have finished the work you have given me to do. And then later it says, and all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. <laughs> our obedience and our doing what he asks us to do brings him glory I want to see him full of glory not weak not inept so it's never going to be some message I preach or some words I share it's the life that I live full of the Spirit, 
submitted to one another that declares who our Lord is. And this is my personal kicker. I would love to put a smile on Jesus' face today. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you love to just have the kind of day that you could lay down, put your head on the pillow, and go, Lord, I think we did pretty good today. Not great, not terrific, but pretty good today. I'm still waiting for that day. <laughs> I am still waiting for one of those days where you can just go, oh, that was, that was amazing. And it, you know it's going to be all him anyway, but ah, it would be amazing. If that doesn't motivate you, if that doesn't stir your heart, you know, again, part of the fear of the Lord is me disappointing him, me grieving him. His reputation is in our hands. <laughs> he calls us the light of the world. This world cannot see him. It can only see you. You know, Chuck Smith used to say, you're the only Bible this world will ever read. Whew. This fear of disappointing him or hurting him, hurting the one that I so love, that so loved me, that motivates me. You know, that motivated Paul, because Paul says, for the love of Christ compels us. It's that love, it's that relationship that compels us. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. This fear has nothing to do with being saved or not saved, or being lost, being cast out. This fear has everything to do with rewards and loss of rewards. You guys all know 1 Corinthians 3.12 now, if anyone builds on this foundation, on this gospel, with gold or silver or precious stones, wood, hay or straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will reveal it, declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on, endures, he will receive a reward. You know, what can go through fire? Gold, silver, precious stones, all can go through fire. But if anyone's work is burned up, <laughs> a little wood, hay, and stubble picture here, right? He will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. Oh, your salvation is guaranteed. You may not bring in any, anything into the kingdom with you. You may not bring any glory to God. You may not have a crown to cast before him. You remember Peter sitting by the enemy's fire that night that the Lord was tested and tried and found guilty. And the Lord had told him, tonight you're going to deny me three times. You know, before the rooster crows. And he goes, not me, Lord. Not me. I got this. I'm good. A couple hours later, you know? And in Luke... 2261 it says then the Lord turned and looked at him in that moment can you imagine you're sitting there Jesus is on trial they've been beating him and crucified they've been doing all kinds of stuff to him and and the little servant girl you know the little brownie scout comes over aren't you one of his disciples I, I don't know what you're talking about I've never been one of his disciples my whole life no way and the rooster and kind of echoes in Peter's mind and then he looks over and Jesus is just looking right at him that had to be one of those moments right I mean how do you picture that look is it just disappointment it what I, I don't know I don't know but that look broke Peter <laughs> that's why we must submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. You know, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself, took on flesh, became a slave, even a slave to the point of death. We're to be imitators of Christ, it says there in 5.1. 
imitators of Christ. And in order to do that, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we must, we must, we must submit one to another. Think of ourselves as equals. Think of ourselves as a team. Think of ourselves as the church. And to glorify it and not me. To glorify them. Because when I glorify the church and when I build the church up, guess what? I'm building myself up. I'm just not doing it selfishly. This is our uniform. This is it. This is our uniform. We've got to put this on. This is what we've been clothed by the King in. And let us put that uniform on and wear it, I want to say proudly, but that's the wrong word. Let us wear it boldly, humbly before our Lord. Next week, marriage, right? Marriage. Next week is a great time. I know half of you are going to be gone because you're going to have a cold or sickness or something. I, I get it. But we're going to be on marriage for a couple of weeks probably. And if we would just learn this in marriage, guess what the most important thing in marriage is? Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord, being, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, that is the most important thing you can do in all of your marriage. I challenge you. Put on your steel-toed shoes, you know. Read ahead and come. And face that challenge that God's placed before us. Marriage. Now, today is communion. I'm excited about communion. I like communion. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to go back to communion old style. We're actually going to pass out the elements this morning. So you can stay seated right where you are. And somehow, they'll get, you know, juice spilled on you or something. I'm looking forward to that. Father, as we come, Lord, as we just hear Peter, Paul's words, Oh, that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, it's an activity we do. We keep our minds busy. We keep our hearts focused. We make sure He's in our will and our direction and our guidance. God, I pray God, that you would fill us, that we would be filled, and that we would learn to submit one to another. I don't care who we are, bosses, and employees, husbands and wives, children and parents. I don't care what the situation is. God, teach us. Because we're all servants. We're all slaves of the Master. And the Master so loved us that He gave His only life. His only body to be broken and his blood to be shed so that we could simply be here a member of the body of Christ oh God help us strengthen us through your spirit in the inner man that we might be children of God Father we praise you for today in Jesus name Amen The Gospel writers tell us that on that night that our Lord would be crucified, He sat down with them, had that Passover meal. He took that bread and He broke it. Right? He'd done that several times before, feeding the 5,000 feeding the 4,000. Here's a time where he breaks it and hands it to just 12 guys. 
right? And he looks at them and he says, oh, this bread has taken on a whole new meaning. Because it's not just a loaf of bread. It's not just food to feed the masses with. This now represents my broken body. It was broken for you. And it's interesting he says that because it hasn't been broken for them yet. They're probably looking at him going, what are you talking about? Because they didn't get the whole crucifixion thing. They, they didn't understand that was all going to happen. Even though he'd plainly taught it several times. No, nah, Jesus can't leave us. He's got us, you know. And he hands it out to him, and he says, This now represents my body. You're going to see how broken it becomes. Broken unto death. Life drained right out of it. And I want you, every time you want to do this, every time you want to commune with me, every time you want to sup with me from now on, I want you to come. I want you to break bread. And then I want you to pray and I want you to remember this points to me. And how it points to me, it points to my death. Because it was in my death that you were saved. It was in my death you know, it's been great these three years hanging out with you and walking around and doing all of this stuff, but it's only in my death that I invite you back to heaven. It's only in my death that you can come and follow me. It's only in my death that you and I can be together. And I need you to chew on that. I need you to think about that. Because it is this broken body that will feed you the rest of your life. And he does this crazy thing. He thanks God for his body. Father, we thank you for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We praise you for all that he accomplished. As we read through the Gospels, we're just amazed at it. And that was him in human flesh. That was him, you know, constricted and contained in a human body. But we know him as Lord of all. We know him as God the Son. We know him as the one who so loved us that he obeyed the Father and came and laid down his body just so we would not be outcasts, would not be thrown into the garbage dump of life, but we would be brought into your family, partakers of the divine nature. Oh God, we thank you and we praise you because such a simple thing for us, taking this body, was such a hard and passionate thing for our Lord. Praise you, God, that he was willing and ready and able to do all that was required to save our lives. Praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. And then he took that cup Oh, guys, you've drinking a, drunk of this cup, drank of this cup, I don't know what the word is, many times. And yet this cup has now changed meanings. It's no longer just a cup of friendship, a cup of communion, a cup of whatever it was in the Passover, but now it's become the very cup of life to a Christian. Because now this, what is the blood of the vine, right? Grape juice or wine has become the blood of Christ that was poured out so that we could be washed white as snow. 
white as snow. It's interesting, you can dig in snow and it's still white on the inside. Don't go digging around in your own heart. You may not find that. But we've been washed by the life blood of Christ. Father, we praise you that you made him so like us that you gave him blood. And in that blood was his life. And on that cross, after he'd suffered all those punishments, of being nailed there, of being scourged, of having that thorn of crowns on his head, even after all of that, those three hours of darkness, he paid an eternal price where you poured out all of your holy wrath upon your only son so he wouldn't be your only son but that we might be adopted in brought in not because of anything we deserve or anything you know we're super smart or super cute or we're the favorite family you know whatever it is but because the price has been paid And that price, as a lamb led to the slaughter, his blood would be poured out upon that altar and he would die. This is the part. This is the Jesus. This is the focus that we're to have at communion. Not as miracles, not as teachings, his very life poured out so that we could have life. Oh, Father, how do we give you enough glory? How do we praise you enough to say thank you? Thank you anyway. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.